On your Thursday episode of Locked On Raptors, I dare you to tell me to not get too excited about that Grady Dick Summer League game. Let's go! You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey! What's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Thursday, July the 13th, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for nine seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on Twitter at Woodley Sean. You can follow, subscribe to, rate, and review the podcast for free on your favorite podcast apps. Of course, those ratings and reviews are lovely. We've been up in the Apple charts lately. That's nice to see, too. Uh, thanks to all those who have jumped on. Thanks to our everydayers as well who are along with us each and every day here on the podcast. And uh, as always, you can also find the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors, and you can uh, join the Discord. The link in the description is uh, the where you go. The link will bring you to the glorious utopia that is the Locked On Raptors Discord, where we talk about basketball in a sophisticated manner, huh? Uh, would love to see you in there. Love all the folks who are already in there. It's been an absolute blast to have this little community build around the show. Uh, all right, on today's show. We're going to dig into uh, mostly Grady Dick's awesome performance in the third summer league game for the Raptors. A loss to the Pistons kind of ended in disappointing fashion with Grady Dick very much involved in the goings on. But overall, I think a lot of really positive takeaways from the third summer league game for Grady Dick. Not that there was ever any need for worry, nor is there really any need to overreact to one good game. But there is a lot of stuff that I think we just kind of saw from Grady Dick in this one that we'll get into that gives me a lot of excitement about how he might fit into the Raptors as soon as his rookie year. We're also getting to some other Summer League notes, uh, digging to Ron Harper Jr. Big Ron, throwing down yams. We'll talk about that. And then Dennis Schroeder, uh, officially uh, signed by the Raptors, announced yesterday. And uh, we will dig into where he fits in on this Raptors team, assigning that I was not very cool uh, cool with at the beginning. You know, it's like, all right, mid-level exemption for Dennis Schroeder. Okay, I guess this is the backup plan. Uh, I'm a little warmer on it in recent days. I still think there are some limitations. We'll get into those at the end of the show. But let's talk about Grady Dick, shall we? Because that was a ton of fun, especially the first half. If you didn't catch the Summer League game, Yesterday evening against the Pistons, Grady Dick, 23 points, 7 boards, 3 assists, a steal on 8 of 19 shooting. He was 6 of 9 on 2s. His struggles in this one came from 3, as they have throughout a lot of Summer League, just 2 of 10 on 3s, and a lot of, like, excellent, excellent looks. A couple of really tough looks as well that I was merely just impressed that he was able to get off. Um, but even, you know, you, you look at the final miss that he had, a uh, wide open sort of could check his watch and check the temperature and put up his finger to test the wind all before he put up the shot. Uh, and it missed. And that was a bummer. It would have tied the game, would have sent us to sudden death uh, summer league overtime, which is always fun. But I, I'm not worried about that miss. I am excited about a lot of the other stuff stuff we saw on display with Grady Dick. And I, and I do think a lot of the things he flashed in this game are the things that matter the most, right? The three-point shot is not going to go anywhere. Dudes just don't forget how to be outstanding three-point shooters. And Grady Dick is that. His release is ridiculous. He gets it off so unbelievably fast. It is released, like, above all the trees. Like, he just kind of seems to emerge from the canopy of arms whenever there's guys around to get that shot off. Uh, and the best shooters in the world routinely go through two of ten spells in games. I'm not worried about that. If the thing that the, you know, widely regarded best shooter in the draft is struggling with is shooting, I, I think you can probably rest easy because that thing will probably come along in due time, as three-point shooting often does with variance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, for me, the thing that really stood out for me in this game, and this was obviously a thing we knew about Grady Dick when he was drafted, and, and you know, have kind of dug into in the weeks since that went down, but. I think the thing that really pops off the screen when you watch Grady Dick is just his off-ball movement is so good and constant and precise and always geared at kind of filling the empty spaces within the geometry of the floor. It seems like he's just kind of got this internal clock and this very, like, 
acute sense of awareness of, oh, okay, there's a rotation going on over there. I'm going to go slide baseline and occupy the corner now because that space needs filling to help balance out the floor. He just seems to have a really good understanding of why his position on the floor matters too because he's such a great shooter, because he spent last year at Kansas being the apple of every defense's eye and having to kind of deal with extra attention, dudes glued to him off the ball. He knows what his gravity does, and the fact that he then puts that into use by moving at all times and sucking in defenders on cuts and relocating to to the proper spots, you know, head faking his defender as he tries to maneuver around screens. He even had a situation where he drew a foul trying to drag a dude through a bunch of screens, and it was just like, yeah, like this is the kind of panic that you're going to see from defense is Grady Dick becomes a more established NBA player and the shot kind of the, the recognition of the shot disseminates around the NBA as pro scouting takes a hold. I, I think uh, I'm just really, really amazed by the, just the intelligence he seems to have as an off-ball mover. That That's the thing that stands out. He does not have to touch the ball at all and he's going to have an impact because of the gravity. And I do think that's going to make him a viable player to put into Raptors lineups like immediately. I think, I mean, they have no reason not to play him heavy minutes. They don't have any shooting on this roster. He brings it. Uh, there's a lot of incentive to play him. And even if there are the sort of defensive misgivings or the issues with the handle that we saw pop up yesterday, I, I think his gravity on offense, his shooting, his quick trigger, I, I think that's going to make him a viable dude to have on the floor from Jump Street. How effective will he be? We'll see. How much will defenses worry about his three-point shot right away? You know, if they're smart, probably quite a bit because that dude can get it off. But I think that is just the thing that really stands out is the dude is going to be like a knows where to stand all-star. He's going to be awesome with that. Uh, other things that really stood out, I mean, again, six of nine on twos. I think he has some pretty interesting moves in his bag when he's inside the arc. He had a couple nice spin moves and just seems to have like a pretty direct approach. And I still am very encouraged by the athleticism he shows just with like his dexterity and his ability to kind of do things on the move and readjust in midair. Um, you know, the, the passing, I think, is also a pretty interesting thing as well. A couple of interesting sort of, you know, he, he get the ball in a scramble or an offensive rebound and instead of going going back up with it, kind of look around and survey for a second. Oh, there's a dude making a 45 cut. Let's just toss it to him for a layup. Um, you know, there's just like a pretty pretty big head on the swivel, like a really, really big basketball mind, it seems, from Grady Dick here. And we're seeing it kind of um, shown off in a lot of ways. I, I think, you know, defensively, that's always going to be a thing. It, it's going to, there are going to be matchups where it's tough. Asar Thompson kind of gave him the business one time, just kind of, drop stepped him and pulled up and dick was just like kind of like all right i've, I've done my best to not lose separate not lose you know contact with you but i'm five feet away from you after that uh quick stop and pop but i, I think for the most part he holds up just fine and again he's a smart basketball player and so i think that's going to serve him very very well as he goes forward and uh, yeah, I'm just, that was a really fun game, man. <laughs> it's just a summer league game. Of course, it doesn't matter in the grand scheme. You're going to want to see him hit his threes. But overall, I, I think we saw a lot of the stuff last night, the basketball IQ stuff, the the rebounding, the the abilities to just sort of, all right, let's just go make something from nothing because I can shoot and get anything off late in the clock, early in the clock, whatever it might be. I think he's going to be a menace in transition as well. I think just as a guy to work around Pascal Siakam, if he's there, Scotty Barnes running the break, him as like a trailer, him as someone who's going to quickly space out to the corners of the wings, that's going to be an absolute weapon for the Raptors. And uh, there's, there's a lot of ways that in, in which I think he's going to find success. Working as a dribble handoff hub with Jakob Pertl, that's going to be beautiful stuff. Working with Scotty Barnes as a dribble handoff hub, that's going to be beautiful. Um, lots of different ways to make use of what Grady Dick brings to the table. And again, he doesn't even have to dribble, which is a beautiful thing on a team that was pretty stagnant to watch last year, had a lot of dudes who wanted to dribble. It's going to be a breath of fresh air to have this dude who can just kind of come in and make everyone's life easier without needing to command the ball even a little bit. I'm, uh, I'm quite excited about the Grady Dick experience so far. We'll come back on the other side, get into some other quick summer league notes. My dude, Bron Harper, I was worried about him in the first half of this game, but did he like earn a two-way with an incredible second half? We'll see. Uh, I still think there's there's something there with Ron Harper. We'll talk about Marquise Noel having some struggles and a couple other quick notes, and then later on we'll get into Dennis Schroeder and how he's going to fit into the Raptors mix. Before all of that, however, today's show is brought to you by Better 
help. It's really useful to have someone who can kind of act as your guide through life, and a therapist can be just that for you. And it doesn't even have to be in response to major trauma or something like that. It can just be the regular trials and tribulations of daily life. Life is hard. Decisions are hard. They affect a lot of people. And to have someone that you can talk these things out with, with no agenda, no biases, just there to listen and offer their counsel, that is a wonderful thing. And BetterHelp offers it. Uh, sometimes in life, we hit it in our face with tough choices, and the path forward isn't always clear. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get connected with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. That's big. You know, you might not have a great fit the first time you try somebody. You can go and switch until you find someone who connects with you. That is fantastic. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. All right, we continue on here. Your first listen of the day. Thank you to the everydayers who are along. If you have not yet, go check out all this week's talk about Pascal Siakam. As the last couple episodes have been largely devoted to that whole thing that hovers over everything the Raptors do over the next little while here. Um, but let's uh, take a quick break from all of that today and continue talking Summer League, shall we? Uh, other other key takeaways from the Summer League game. Look, this is not a terribly good Summer League roster. It's not very deep. It doesn't have, obviously, Jeff Doughton and Christian Coloco, who would be the anchors of this team. They would form the backbone of this squad, probably make it a lot easier for a guy like Grady Dick to have a lot of success working off slightly more talented players. But I still think you know this was easily their best game so far. Even though they blew it at the end, this was a game where they fell down a lot early, made a nice comeback. The second quarter was awesome. Grady Dick going off. That was fun. Um, fourth quarter, the offense dries up. I believe it, the stat came in from Kirtika, the wonderful uh, Raptors stats queen of Twitter, uh, noting that it was the last 8.04 of the fourth quarter where the Raptors failed to score a field goal. That's not great. But also, I don't especially care. Uh, it's summer league. The results don't matter so much. But uh, as far as other takeaways on guys, I think Ron Harper Jr. stood out. You know, the first half was really rough for him, actually. A couple bad turnovers, a couple brick shots, and just didn't quite look like he was within the flow of the game. I thought in the second half, he really kind of found his stride. Missed all his threes. That's a shame. But four of ten from the field. So four of seven on his twos. He had seven boards in this one, 12 points overall. And I think just, I think Ron Harper kind of has like, I mean, he's a very NBA player's son player, right? Like he just kind of understands how basketball works. He's a knows where to stand guy as well. Um, I think he has just like a really good feel for the game. The problem is, does he have the athleticism to sort of play at the speed of the NBA. That's kind of always been the thing. A little bit of slow decision-making at times as well. It'll kind of come to him on the wing, and he'll take a second to sort of figure out what the next thing is as opposed to just making that quick move. And that's obviously something the Raptors are not going to be super big fans of as they move to this 0.5 offense with Darko Ryakovich. But I think there's still something there with Ron Harper to tap into as just like a connective piece. I, he's never going to be a star or anything like that, obviously. he's you know Odds are he's probably never going to be a regular NBA player at this point. But I, I do think just the feel for the game, I'm a sucker for a dude who just kind of knows how basketball works and has like a good feel for how to connect better players. I think that can be something Ron Harper does to sort of tie together bench looks or something like that. Um, this is all to say... I'd be perfectly all right if one of the two remaining two-way spots for this team goes to Ron Harper Jr. If for nothing else, then that he's like a wonderful bench celebration guy as well. Um, but I do think there's something there and that could be sort of refined a little further in the G League for another season and, and you know, the odd NBA action here and there. I'm a, I'm a Ron Harper Jr. aficionado, and I was happy to see him have a really nice second half in this game. Shame it didn't all uh, work out so well, and he was a team worse minus 21, um, but the sort of eye test stuff I thought with Ron Harper looked pretty good in this one. Marquise Noel. Mm, not so good. Uh, <laughs> this was a pretty rough one for the undrafted rookie. Two of 13 from the field, 0 of 5 from deep. He had the unfortunate... Very unfortunate missed walk away Steph Curry celebration three that ended up being a giant brick that didn't even hit rim. That's tough for our guy Marquise. He honestly would not strike me as the type to have that kind of 
situation befall him. He seems far too cool for that, but it happens to the best of us, I suppose. And this game, I mean, he got blocked a couple times, just kind of trying to go to the rim and just far too small. And it was among the trees and it didn't work out so well for him. He still got just like some pretty ridiculous passes in his bag. The way he kind of wraps passes around guys is super fun. Uh, there were a couple times where the guys receiving his passes didn't quite do many favors in this one. He ends up with four turnovers. Um, certainly not the most encouraging game for Marquise Noel. I, I think, you know, it all depends on what your level of realism has been since Marquise Noel was signed. I know there are some fo- some folks out there being like, oh, maybe he like could actually get some real minutes this year on a team with no guards. Like, hmm. I don't think so. He's not going to play probably any minutes for the NBA team this year, barring some sort of disaster. And frankly, I, I think he's best served as like a 905 steward almost, right? Like he's just like he's got a really good understanding of how to be a point guard, how to set guys up, how to be a table setter. Didn't love that he kind of commandeered things a little bit in late in this game and sort of their, their worst offensive stretch in that fourth quarter coincided with Marquise Noel kind of having a spell of heat checking a stove that was very clearly not on. <laughs> and so that was a bit of a bummer, but, you know, I don't think I'm like, you know, I get, get him off of his two way or anything like that. I think he's going to be a perfectly nice guy to have with a 905. It's good to have a point guard, someone to just run the show, someone to be the adult who kind of knows how things are going to work every time down the floor. I'm perfectly fine with Marquise Noel, but not a great game. And I think a pretty good indicator that his height is going to be a pretty significant obstacle for him to overcome in time. If he's going to become an NBA player, it's just, it sucks. It's it's, it's the way it is. When you're five, seven, things are very hard in a sport where tall guys do good. Uh, A couple other guys to hit on. Mohamedou Guy, uh, or G, sorry, I pronounced it incorrectly. Pretty fun game in this one, honestly. He's been starting games for the nine, for, for, for the Raptors here. Um, played last year for the Texas Legends. I wonder if he's just going to be like a pretty obvious 905 hand this year. 15 points, 7 boards, 3 assists, and a steal in this game for him. 5 of 8, hit 1-3. He's a very striking player to watch. Like He's very fluid and athletic for a guy who's as long and sort of gangly as him. He's got uh, pretty interesting like just dimensions to look at him on the floor. Uh, it, I... I don't know. He's not got like a track record of, oh, wow, this guy's like an uncovered gem. He was undrafted last year, um, went to the G League this past season, was like a nine point a game player at Pitt when he was in college. Like nothing crazy, but I do kind of like a guy who doesn't have those crazy, you know, I'm the guy with the ball in my hand stats, right? I I think there is a lot of value to someone who knows how to do role player things. And it seems like G actually knows how to do role player things. And so I'd be a little interested to see, is there more you can tap into there? It's sort of like, he's almost like a longer, more spindly version of Malcolm Miller in my mind from back in the day. You know, Malcolm Miller was never someone who went down to the G League and dominated and took like 20 shots a game and was averaging 25. He was more of a, I'm a catch-and-shoot guy wherever I am, so I'm going to stand in the corner in the G League, I'll stand in the corner in the NBA, and I'll be a catch-and-shoot guy regardless of uh, what level I'm at. And guys who are kind of wired for that role-player life, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of those dudes. Like, dudes kind of know their lane and stay within it and excel within it. And G kind of feels to me, from the very limited watching of him in Summer League, kind of like that type of player who knows... He's never going to be the main guy. He's never going to be more than like a fourth or fifth option in most lineups he's ever going to play in. And so he has to do the stuff on the margins to be effective. I thought he did that pretty well in this game. I I thought he just kind of affected the game pretty nicely when he was in there for his 23 minutes in this one. Uh, My last note is on Moses Brown. He had a nice game, 13 points, 5 of 7. Dude dunks a lot, blocks a lot of shots. Uh, You know, he's 7 foot 2. You'd expect him to kind of dominate with his size at this level in summer league. Um, I, I don't think he's someone we're going to see the Raptors give like a two-way deal to. I'd be pretty surprised there, honestly. Maybe it's just like big man insurance, but I think they have so many options up front, whether it's traditional centers or guys that can play as interesting backup centers in, in sort of small ball situations. I just don't really see a pathway for Moses Brown here. And, and I think, you know, he's going to look a lot better against this competition than he does against the NBA competition because he's not terribly quick. He's not like the most fleet of foot guy. He, he's going to have his struggles kind of guarding in space and all of that. And, and, you know, the offensive bag is not exactly, uh, you know, 
profound. It's basically throw it to me near the basket and I'll dunk it, which is a nice thing. But I, I don't think he's anything more than a 905 hand. That said, you have your 905 team sort of anchored by Marquise Noel and Moses Brown as your pick and roll combination that everything flows from. You could do a lot worse. I, I think that's a perfectly fine way for the 905 to go into next year with uh, with their plans. So those are my uh, quick other takeaways from the rest of the Summer League dudes. Again, Grady Dick, really the only guy of extreme note here. He will be an NBA player. I, you know, I'd be surprised if he gets any, you know, G League time this year, frankly. I, I think his shooting is going to be important right away. Maybe there becomes a glut on the wing and Jalen McDaniels grabs a spot and they feel like they want to get Grady some more time down in the 905 just to get more touches. But frankly, I think Grady Dick's going to be better served playing in the NBA because he's not someone who's going to thrive playing around sort of lesser players, I don't think, right? Like he's the kind of guy who's going to amplify good players because of his connective passing, because of his three-point shooting and cutting. And I think he can be someone who really, really sort of does the bulk of his development kind of getting tested playing alongside good players. I, I think that's kind of what I want to see here for Grady Dix. So uh, that's it. One more Summer League game to go. This team will not be going to the knockout round of Summer League, it seems, and uh, perfectly fine by me because I don't really want to watch Summer League games on a weekend in July. Uh, but we'll come back on the other side, leave the Summer League stuff for now, and talk about the newest official Toronto Raptors signing, Dennis Schroeder. If you're a Herbie Kuhn fan out there, then uh, shout out. Uh, we'll get into Dennis on the other side, where he's going to fit in, reasons for optimism, reasons for concern, some numbers that uh, paint a picture of the lineups he should probably be playing in. We'll get into all that coming up in just a sec. Before we do that, however, got to tell you, but our friends over at bird dogs who make the most comfortable shorts in the whole wide world they are incredible they come in all sorts of different styles from khakis to oxfords to gym shorts and they are just they're breathable they're light they are summery in every single fashion and they also are from the future as i've talked about before they have this comfort lining sewn into the each and every pair of shorts they have that make underwear obsolete especially in the summertime when it's hot you don't want to have extra layers of stuff going on down there if you have that that comfort lining in there you have removed the need for underwear which is a beautiful thing and bird dogs are just uh, yeah as comfortable a pair of shorts as you will ever wear i wear them when i go shoot around at the park at playing basketball it's a beautiful beautiful thing uh go check out bird dogs right now show off yourself wearing your bird dogs uh you know t tell us if you've got them give us a little leg shot all that stuff send them on in go to birddogs.com slash locked in nba that's the promo code of locked in nba for a free yeti style tumbler that's birddogs.com slash locked in nba or the promo code locked in nba for a free yeti style tumbler you won't want to take your bird dogs off we promise you all right we continue on here your first listen of the day Locked on Raptors, your Thursday episode. A uh, reminder, tomorrow on the show, Jamar Hines is going to be along. As we're going to take a look back at the second half of the 2021-22 season and try to see, like, is there any reason for belief here that the Siakam and Barnes duo could actually have some staying power with a more sensible roster around them? My hunch is that we're going to find lots of reasons for optimism, but we'll have that on tomorrow's show. Looking forward to to that. Uh, let's talk about Dennis Schroeder, shall we? The newest Toronto Raptor officially announced yesterday. It was down at Summer League, interviewed on the Summer League broadcast, and uh, you know, lots to dig into here with Dennis Schroeder. We haven't dug a ton into the sort of way in which he's going to fit into the Raptors, and I, and I do think there are some interesting numbers and just some track record stuff with him that paint a picture of a guy who is very successful under certain circumstances, less so under others. We'll get into that. The first thing I want to note, though, is I hadn't even kind of put this together, but Darko Ryakovic and Dennis Schroeder clearly have themselves a bit of a relationship dating back to Darko's time with the OKC Thunder and that glorious 2019-20 Thunder team, which I love. Like, one of my favorite one-off teams ever, the Chris Paul, Shea Gildas-Alexander, Dennis Schroeder, I think Danilo Gallinari, Steven Adams starting five that just destroyed teams all year long was like the best lineup in basketball. Schroeder looked at his best, I think, that we've ever seen. Um, his defense made it viable to have three guard lineups on the floor for as much time as that Thunder team did. That was the peak of the Dennis Schroeder experience in his NBA career, to my eyes. I really, really enjoyed watching him that year. It's not something I can say about a lot of other times in his career. 
Um, but it, it was super fun. And to have that connection with Darko, to know that they're on good terms, you know, I, I think that's a good thing. It can't be a bad thing, right? I, I don't know how much it matters in like the grand scheme of things, but it's nice that the coach and the new point guard at least have some simpatico going in and a little bit of an understanding. I think the big question with Schroeder, though, is where he fits in here, because I think the sort of first blush conventional wisdom is, oh, they signed him to replace Fred Van Vliet. He's going to be the starting point guard. I don't know if you can do that. I just, it does not seem to be in line with his strengths and the sort of circumstances that tend to bring out the best of Dennis Schroeder. Most of the best success Schroeder's had in his career have come in lineups with other good ball handlers alongside him and three-point shooting. You know, those lineups with CP3 and Shea Gildas Alexander, Dennis Schroeder's not asked to do a whole lot. Um, Austin Reeves and LeBron James were the, the partners with Dennis Schroeder in ball handling in ball handling during the playoff run where the Lakers looked very good. Um, and that starting five was was incredible. Just completely ran teams off the floor. But you had Austin Reeves doing his thing and LeBron freaking James flanking Dennis Schroeder, so we didn't have to do the lion's share of the creation. Even having D'Angelo Russell out there was a positive indicator for Schroeder's on offs. If you kind of go through his lineup data on uh cleaning the glass, the wonderful Ben Falk site. Uh, that's that's really kind of the uh, the sweet spot for Schroeder is having an, at least one more ball handler, preferably two guys who can kind of hold ha- handle the rock, put it on the deck, etc., and then having some shooting out there to flank him because he's not an excellent shooter and he's not a very willing shooter either. He's a pretty low volume guy. Um, the most successful lineup even last year in the regular season for the Lakers with Schroeder was Schroeder with Patrick Beverly, who can shoot, Troy Brown, who can only shoot and not much else, LeBron James and Thomas Bryant, who also can kind of only shoot and not much else. Very, very shooting heavy looks. So that is a bit of a conundrum because the Raptors, of course, don't have a whole lot of shooting. And so they're going to have to be particular, I think, about the ways in which they deploy Schroeder to get the best out of him. And I just don't think he's going to give his best to the Raptors in a starting five where OG Ananobi is really the only credible three-point shooter. Like a Schroeder, OG, Barnes, Siakam, Pirtle starting five, if they were to just do the straight swap of uh, Fred out, Schroeder in, I think that's pretty tough. I, I, I don't see there being, A, the, the shooting to sort of augment Schroeder's lack of it. I don't see the shooting to give him like more space to work as a pick and roll operator. And he's not a guy who's finished well at the rim in his career that despite being able to get to the paint whenever he wants, he does not finish well at the rim. And so I'm a little concerned that we're not going to quite see the best out of Jakob Pertl in that pick and roll combination either. You know, there are drawbacks of a Jakob Pertl, Scotty Barnes or Jakob Pertl, Pascal Siakam pick and roll as well. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I, I think Schroeder with that sort of shooting starved group is not going to be at his best. And so if you're going to lean into the Scotty and Pascal or the lead ball handlers thing, just do it. I think insert Gary Trent Jr. into the starting five, have at least Gary and OG out there to space and see what you can make work. See if there's a workable offense to find there. I don't see there being a workable offense with Dennis Schroeder as the lead ball handler in that starting five. Um, and I don't see him being like an off-ball guy either because he's just not a very good three-point shooter and throughout his career has not been a very high-volume three-point shooter either. Just two and a half attempts last year on catch-and-shoots. Sorry, 2.8 attempts last year on catch-and-shoots. Shot 35%, which is passable, but not something that's going to give you a ton of confidence and not something that opposing defenses are going to be worried about conceding. If teams are allowing Dennis Schroeder to take wide-open threes, it's because they want Dennis Schroeder taking wide-open threes because it's... The, the worst of all evils potentially on the floor. Um, and he's also not a pull-up threat either, right? You know, we, we talked about Fred Van Vliet. Fred had four and a half pull-up attempts a game last year. An incredibly important thing to keep a defense honest, to keep a pick-and-roll attack with all of its options intact. And Dennis Schroeder doesn't do that. He shot under 30% on 0.5 attempts on pull-ups last year. That's going to be a missing element that Fred like is just not going to have replaced by the current players on this roster. As much as people don't like Fred or whatever, um, you cannot argue against his pull-up shooting being an agent for space on this Raptors team that is no longer there. Um, and so, yeah, with these starter-heavy groups, I, I just don't really see it with Schroeder. You know, look at some of the numbers as well for him. 
just as like a lead ball handler type uh, as a pick and roll ball handler last year in the playoffs, 0.77 points per 100 possessions. That was like 16th percentile. Very stinky. Uh, 41% of his possessions were as a pick and roll ball handler as well. Um, had a 0.89 points per possession as a scorer in pick and roll ball handler situations last year in the regular season. Also still not very good, just like a smidge uh, under the 50th percentile, I believe. I'd lost the page. Um, and as a spot-up guy, again, not doing a ton for you. 0.91 points per possession uh, as a spot-up guy in the playoffs. That's not very good. Slightly better, 1.05 points per possession as a spot-up guy in the regular season last year in the 57th percentile in the NBA. So 43% of players were better than him. Again, he's not someone that teams are going to be melting down if he's left wide open for three. And he's not someone I think you want running offense with a pretty stilted lineup spacing-wise. And so... Where I really think Dennis Schroeder can be a big impact on this team is in second unit lineups and really tying together the second unit in a way that they could never do with Fred Van Vliet because Fred Van Vliet, when he sat, they, they just they had nothing else to tie those second units together. So maybe the first unit's a mess now and the second unit has some structure to it. But I do think there's enough shooting within the Raptors bench ranks and with the starters you can stagger in to make some pretty interesting looks with Schroeder as the lead guard. Um, you know, I think if you load a second unit with shooting, you throw in Grady Dick, you throw in Jalen McDaniels, who has that shooting upside. Um, maybe Otto Porter Jr. is healthy, and you can throw him in there. Maybe Pressures Achua finds that three-point stroke again. But I, I do like Schroeder, Dick, McDaniels as like a core three for bench lineups. And then from there, you can start peppering in starters, right? Throw OG in there to help with the defense of that group and give it some shooting in space. Give OG some free reign to go do some of, some of his creation stuff that he wants to do as well. Gary Trent Jr., obviously, throw him into those lineups. It's a lot of shooting, maybe a little bit less defense. But uh, the thing about Dennis Schroeder is really good defender at the point of attack. He's going to help a lot with the Raptors' issues with blow buys that we saw pretty much start to finish last year. Um, and so you have those guys. And then you maybe use this opportunity to kind of sprinkle in a little Scotty small ball five to get him a window of a game where he can impact it from an area where we know he's very effective as a short roller, where he's working from the middle of the floor, where he can go score over the Giants in the middle or you know create and spray out passes from the nail. Um, there's a lot of potential there. And I think like Schroeder, Dick, OG, McDaniels, Barnes, Sign me up for that bench lineup. Like, that sounds really fun to me. and sounds like there's a lot of potential there. Um, I think if you can give Dennis Schroeder multiple shooters and maybe an extra ball handler to help him out, that'll be the way to sort of get the most out of him. I think there will be some small ball lineups where he can kind of slide in if they're going to go a little bit more small and spacey, maybe Pascal at the five, OG, Trent, and, you know, whomever else you want on the wing. He could even be Barnes, frankly. Um, you know, OG, Trent, Barnes, Schroeder, Pascal, like maybe there's something there. I, uh, I, I think there's, again, I'm not like terribly optimistic that he's going to come in and be a 30 minute a game starter and have success. I think that could be kind of painful if he's playing 30 minutes a game as a starter, but as a really dependable backup point guard who gives you some structure, who gives you defense at the point of attack, um, I, I think he can certainly make a pretty good impact on this team. And those shooting heavy bench lineups, I think, will be the haven in which Dennis Schroeder finds his most success this coming year. Uh, all this, of course, subject to change if the Raptors make a big, massive trade at some point. So put a pin in that for now, I suppose. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please support the show by subscribing, following, rating, and reviewing wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Just hit the big red subscribe button on the tube. It really helps out. It's much appreciated when you go ahead and do that as we push towards 3,500 subs over on the YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, the Discord, always going, always welcoming new people. The link is in the description. Come and hang out. Follow on Twitter, follow on Instagram, on down the line. We'll be back again tomorrow with Jamar Hines as we take a look back at the second half of 21-22, the glorious, glorious close to that season the Raptors had where they were beating excellent teams, where Scotty and Pascal were doing their beautiful transition thing they were playing weirdo 6-9 lineups all over the place it was a great time we're going to revisit that and see if there's any kernels of optimism for the future we can pull from it that'll be tomorrow until then thank you so much have a great day and uh bye-bye thanks for hanging